afternoon. In 2013, I was assigned to this work in preparation for the celebration of Mexico Conference at the Library of Congress. The conference focused on the Mexican cultural heritage and arts in the United States. Part of the celebration included the unveiling of this drawing by Martin Ramirez. My name is Susan Peckham and I'm a paper conservator at the Library of Congress. For the next few moments, I will tell you the story of how this drawing arrived at the library and uh, I'll try to share some of the thoughtful collaborations that occurred um, as we try to ensure that each treatment step and uh, analysis decision was uh, made um, in the best way possible. For several months, senior archives technician Tracy Barton sorted, organized, and processed the manuscripts and archival portions of the mid-century mid-20th century design collection of Charles and Ray Eames. Uh, one day in September 2009, on the very bottom of an old box of Eames, Barton was surprised to find a rolled and crumpled and very brittle, colorful drawing on what appeared to be pieced papers glued together, including newspaper advertisements, mailings, and envelopes. Uh, for example, here are the details of a Flower of the Month Club, uh, the associated envelope and a handwritten note. The largest paper fragment on the verso proved to be a rather racy advertisement for male ordering pictures of young women models. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> having become fairly familiar with the Eames interests over the past months, at first glance, Barton thought that perhaps the drawing was by a child, because the Eames um, collected things like that. Um, and you can see that at first glance, you might think that too. There's a bright green tree sprouting out of the top, lots of repetition, lines, a lot of undulations and movements. Um, however, on the verso, Barton noticed a few clues. A date of April 50th, April, or April 19th, 1950, on one mailing label, and the other, t and uh, this mailing label, and this mailing label, showed an address of Auburn, California. Um, so nowadays, what do folks do when you are afflicted with the need for sudden need for information? She Googled it. So she Googled, and I have to say the word, she Googled outsider art, and <laughs> and uh, Auburn, California. She found image after image showing similar lines, the sh similar uses of lines and shape, and in each case, the artist's name was Martin Ramirez. So there's been quite a few papers and essays, um, catalogs, exhibits. Lots of information has been written about Martin Ramirez, so we know a little bit about him. Um, he uh, left Jalisco, Mexico in 1925. He left three daughters and an expectant wife um, to go work on the railroads in Northern California as well as the mines. Um, it was a very bad time in Mexican history. The um, Cristero Revolution was going on. Um, Depression had happened. There wasn't any money. He was an, an, afraid of losing the ranch that he was say, or ranchero that he was uh, saving money for in Mexico. So he did what he needed to do by coming up to the north. Unfortunately, he became very sick, and uh, according to the records, he was adjudicated insane in 1933. He went on to live in the the Stockton State Hospital through the 30s and 40s and then lived the rest of his life in the new DeWitt State Hospital in Auburn from 1948 until his death in 1963. Um, in retrospect, um, his, it, what was called catatonic schizophrenia, it might, he might have received a very different dose of, or, um, diagnosis now. He, um, he might have just been really depressed, really missed his family, missed his culture, missed his horses. He was a horse rider. 
um, before he came up north. Um, sounded like he was probably a just, well, you know, what do I know? But he seemed like he was a very sad person who was very depressed. And he was also put in the tuberculosis ward, um, which apparently was um, fairly typical to put uh, indigent people into the tuberculosis wards. And that probably would make anyone probably a little nuts. So. I guess luckily in 1948, uh, Dr. Tarmo Pasto, who was a psychologist who was just on the um, brink of the um, art-based therapy that was occurring in psycho psycho psychological areas of medicine, um, he started working with Martin. He was completely taken back by his need to make art constantly. And we have several firsthand accounts of what he was using and they, all, they can be very bizarre sounding. We have um, Ramirez collected crayons, colored pencils, water-based paints, possibly shoe polish and fruit juices, which he combined together into a liquid medium that he then mixed into a homemade pot. Instead of a brush, he utilized wooden matchsticks as styluses. A tongue depressor became his straight edge. Um, what some of the main um, first-hand accounts we have are from another artist named Wayne Tebow, and Wayne Tebow was actually a student of, um, of um, uh, Dr. Tarmo Pasto, and he visited Martin uh, several times. And he also said, let's see, where is it? He, uh, he also used uh, several of, of this sort of thing. Um, it's, just a, it's just a little model of arches, but you can tell that he's, he was using things that he could repeat over and over again. Um, and uh, Wayne Tebow had seen him use several things like this. So together, um, Dr. Pasto and uh, several other community members actually exhibited some of these works by Martin Ramirez. Um, you know, art of the schizophrene. <laughs> you know, it's very upsetting, but um, I think that just this image alone could open up all kinds of discussion about what, where does outsider art belong and does it belong in a museum? Um, it's sort of like putting the insane person on exhibit. Uh, I find it really troubling. Here are many Madonnas that he did. And what's very interesting, um, and when you read different art historians accounts, you get all kinds of different views. Um, most of these are called Madonnas, and they all are very similar. Um, they have the upstretched arms. The hands are in the John, it's called the John gesture, which is holding a finger like this, which means um, bapt the, in baptism or redemption. Um, there's a pal over many of their arms. Uh, there's obviously crowns. Um, probably the, the most common feature are, is the globe or the orb that's under the feet and uh, the, cre or the um, um, figure crushes this, the snake with its shoes. Well, it turns out that the Madonna that's um, still in view at the, la the, the Lady of Immaculate Conception, it's in the parish where Martin Ramirez and his wife married. So, you know, is this just a very homesick man who is drawing visions of home? Um, all the rest of his imagery, you see um, little cars, trains, uh, horse riders. They're all very common imagery throughout his works. Now, you're probably wondering, okay, so you know who he is, and you have this work, and so who does it belong to? Um, and that became quite the question because um, it's 2015, it was found in 2009, and um, it wasn't until 2010 where Tracy was actually um, going through more of the archives, and she found this letter. And this is the letter that sort of links it all together. This is the letter that um, uh, Don Burrell, the, the, the director of the E.B. Crocker Art Gallery, wrote to Charles Eames saying, hey, I've got these images, and I think you might be really interested in them. Um, get back to me. Well, they didn't come back to him. They stayed in this box. And uh, now we know how they got to the Library of Congress because they were bequeathed with the Eames collection. All right, so 
who owns it? Um, and the answer is uh, the Ames Foundation doesn't, doesn't own it because the lawyer, the, the way the law worked in California is once the law adjudicated that someone was insane, that meant that they could no longer own property or therefore give property away. So he could not have given the property to the gallery. So therefore the gallery could not have given it to the Eames. Um, so it really still belongs to the family. But the family was eager to give it to the Library of Congress for a small um, gift. So that's how it, has, it stays at the Library of Congress now. Now this is the part that I get really, really excited about and I spent way, probably a little bit too much time on. Um, I'm absolutely fascinated with the, with the um, mark making in, uh, on this piece. At first glance, when I was first assigned it, I was convinced that it, uh, it had to be colored pencil, it had to be crayon, it, maybe it was watercolor. Um, after I did all my water solubility tests and realized that everything was so incredibly frightfully water soluble except the orange media, um, I, I, and I had absolutely not seen any watercolor that ever reacted exactly like this, I went back to all the um, sources I could find and I printed out every one of the first-hand accounts I could find. Because I figured if there's a few um, first-hand accounts, there's got, there must be more. Somebody must have been paying attention to what he was using. Um, I just kept finding the same sort of thing. Oh, discarded n nurses' notes, magazines, newspapers, um, examining table covers, homemade adhesives. Um, he was chewing his, was he chewing his own mashed potatoes? Was he chewing bread? Was he making his own glues? I kept coming across all these really fabulous first-hand accounts, but it seemed to me that it'd be, it'd be really interesting to sort of figure this out because so many of these works are all over the United States and they look similar. I mean, until you can go up and see each of one of them in, in person, I, you know, I can't really say that um, other institutions have used their, their Madonna show the same brushwork or the same um, mark making. However, uh, I started fiddling and so what I did is I took matchsticks, like um, the, 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 the uh, first hand account by Wayne Tebow. Um, I used my wooden matchstick as a stylus. And when I ran out of matchsticks, I cut thin slices of a match book or um, a map board so that it looked like matchsticks. And I started fiddling with different um, watercolor in the lab and acrylics and it wasn't looking quite right. And uh, I, um, I, I did a little bit of fiddling, trying to figure out what he was, what he was, how he was putting the line down. And um, my father suggested, when I, su when I asked him about the time period, he had memory of um, being in an office where, back in the day before spreadsheets, people would actually make their own um, posters and spreadsheets. And I remember this because I used to help my dad when I was a kid do his. So I asked him if he also did the same thing in the 50s, and he did. And it turns out that um, the, the first, sort of the first generation of porous pens were nothing really more than a glorified fountain pen that had a chunk of, of uh, wool on the end of it, a little wool tip. And you would open the back, and you would pour your ink in and you would screw it all back together again, or you would have the kind that you would actually dip the tip into the ink bottle and it would suck it up. Now, obviously these companies that put together these sorts of pens, they wanted you to buy their inks, but their inks were a little bit different. They were not the same thing as typical um, fountain pen inks. And I fiddled with some of the inks that came with uh, dry pen ink the dry line pen that's made by Sanford's and the Flowmaster that was made by Estabrook. Um, I fiddled with both of those brands. Yes, I was on eBay a lot. I have to admit it, uh, Etsy and eBay, it's amazing that there are all these great pieces out there and they're not very expensive. Um, the marks just really seemed to work and I thought it seemed perfectly feasible to me that if I was living in a state hospital and I was just going to get materials that other people gave me, It'd be pretty easy to give someone some fountain, some plain old um, fountain pen ink, and you just fiddle with what you had, right? You don't have to have the exact ink because most of these inks that come with these um, early pens actually, some of them actually ha are more solvent-based, like a toluene or xylene, like what you would think of as a precursor to a magic marker. 
whereas uh, fountain pen inks um, usually had a base of ethanol or isopropanol, something like that. Okay, so here are the felt tips, and look at those great shapes. If, I don't know, if I've, I've made several little shapes, and I tried to see if I could replicate um, the green. And I came fairly close to replicating the green. Um, the little sharp tip, um, there's a tip that I'm not showing here, well, there it is. That's a little bit sharper, and it comes the closest to replicating um, whoops. these little red dots here. All right, so it's just an idea. I'm probably crazy, but it seems to work um, as one possibility, along with the pieces of map boards and, or match stylus, if you, if you will. So um, I wanted to know, well, I was able to find a couple of these online, but I wonder w where else they are. And so um, luckily at the Library of Congress, I can look up a, all kinds of old magazines and, and periodicals. And what I found was um, this particular issue of office management and equipment from um, March of 1950 uh, had a whole section of marking devices called fountain brush type. And there's lots of companies that made this sort of thing. And here's some ads that I found. And these were marketed to lots of different people. Um, popular mechanics, analytical chemistry, school arts, office management, American artist. And it, you know, it really did seem like it, was, it must have been sweeping the country because there were a lot of different places you could find these. And um, here are some other brands. Um, I had to throw this in here because I couldn't stand not to mention this little bit of trivia, but um, here is part of the evolution into the magic marker. And here's the earliest advertisement I could find for magic marker. And um, it's 1951. But uh, you can tell we've gone from calling it the Flowmaster Fountain Brush, and then uh, this company, Cushman and Denison, changed it to Felt Tip Pen. And then a couple of years, well, this is actually 51, this is 59. These words were all sort of interchangeable. So that's one little piece of useless trivia. The other thing I thought was really interesting is the, the, the word Flowmaster. Um, if you, I came across it a few times online, and then I checked with our intern from Poland, and apparently the word Flowmaster or Flowmaster is generic for magic marker in Eastern Bloc, old Eastern Bloc countries. So um, apparently these things were so ubiquitous, and in the 1950s that term sort of just stuck, which I thought was kind of interesting. Okay, so what I did next is um, I, I received permission to have some analyses done, and to, I looked at some colorants on the actual Ramirez itself. Forty-four spots were chosen to try to figure out what actually was Ramirez using. Um, I was really lucky that this had been called for exhibit for the special show um, the following December, which is and this was a very big find for the library, and people were very excited about it. I probably would not have been able to have my colleagues in research and testing spend time on this. But they looked at it with x-ray fluorescence, and we even had some hyperspectral imaging done. Um, and then another uh, scientist helped me with the adhesive analysis. So just quickly, if you know anything about XRF, I wasn't sure of the audience today, but um, what XRF basically does is it, it's an x-ray that hits um, certain elements and it excites the element in a very particular signature way, and what that element emits back out is what you can see graphed. And it works for elements that are, that are um, heavier than carbon. So it's not any good for compounds. If you're trying to find something that has nitrogen or oxygen or carbon in it, it's not gonna be very useful. But it can be very useful when you're trying to identify something by um, a metal, which is what I mean by an element, by the metal. So here are the spots that we analyzed. And here is um, a multispectral example. So what happens with multispectral imaging is that it's the same sort of, sort of idea where the colorants have a, ra a range of light that's emitted on it, and then different materials will emit back. So whereas here, we find out that the blue has iron in it, and there's also kind of a dark blue-gray that also has iron. 
we don't know the difference between those two irons, but we can tell when we go to the multispectral that, um, whoops, when we go back to the multispectral, both of these are blue right here. two things have to do with anything. Well, uh, I'm going to go across one more slide. This is laundry bluing. And it was an idea that Lynn Brostoff had. She thought, is it possible that they could have been using a Prussian blue pigment? Well, you don't really buy. There aren't, it's really hard to find um, pigments and, and paint media that have Prussian blue in them anymore. It's just, it's not something that's commonly found in a watercolor, water-based system. So she had this idea, and I think it's because she'd worked with ethnographic materials before, because um, in the west, on the northwest coast and in the southwest, it, liquid, the, the liquid bluing that contains Prussian blue has been in the trade routes for hundreds of years. So this is a really common thing. And in paper conservation, we don't run across this very often. So. Um, I thought this was brilliant, and the peaks are perfect. It's, this is probably, a, a, it's probably a, a, a laundry bluing that he was using. I think that's, you know, he's obviously using whatever he can get on hand. Um, the other thing that I was reading about, now this is only anecdotal because I haven't had the Raman spectroscopy the spectra done yet, but all of these very typical um, uh, fountain pen inks that are called blue blacks, they're blue blacks because people knew that the blue faded eventually, but they still wanted it to be dark. So they stuck iron gall ink in it. So it could be possible that this blue back here, the dark bluish black um, that you see here and here, and that, it, that separates out on our multispectral shot or our hyperspectral shot, it could be iron gall ink. Um, it turns out that the um, pink matchstick that Wayne Thibault had thought might be um, one of the possible sources of the pink cheek, that didn't turn out to be, that was kind of a dead end, but I thought it was worth trying since it was in the literature. And um, when we tested the fountain inks to see if anything had si similar signatures to what we found in the Ramirez itself, this is what they look like before you um, put them in the XRF. And for the reds, we had a very clear peak for bromine, and the only time you really see bromine in any kind of a colorant is when you have it in red ink. And so I got on eBay and Etsy, and I bought um, several brands of um, red fountain pen ink. And it turns out that these five containers all had eosine. They, they all have them had identical um, peak bromine peaks to the one that was in the Ramirez red. So that was kind of exciting. Um, the uh, next group of testing that occurred was for the adhesive testing because we had been we had read that he had made his own adhesives, and so I worked with Janet Adams on this, and we took samples in six different places, and this is just my rough testing up here. This is just called microchemical testing. This is when you use an iodine test reagent. You probably all did it in high school or college. This is just the easy test. So this is a negative starch test. This is positive because we just used starch paste from the lab, and you can tell that sample A had some starch positive right here, and again, sample B was um, positive also because it looks more like the, the known positive than the known negative. So we knew that all six spots definitely had starch-based adhesive, but which starch? So what Jeanette and I did is um, we made all kinds of samples, mashed potatoes, tapioca, uh, mushed up bread, macerated bread, macerated mashed potatoes, and um, she put those three through uh, several analyses and discovered that the one that comes the closest to um, the, the Ramirez adhesives, um, based on the size of the starch molecule, or the starch granule, it was actually masticated bread. And she, I guess she had her son actually chew up some of the bread to get the right size, and that, that's what it looked like. So. Um, now, the treatment of this piece. Um, doing the analysis was really interesting, and I, but I put the actual treatment off as long as I could. For one thing, um, 
it was kind of disgusting. It uh, was covered, did you hear me say it was covered in homemade adhesive that I thought it probably was mixed with saliva? I, need, I wanted to make sure, and I'm not a queasy person, but I just needed to make sure that if someone had been on the tuberculosis unit, I needed to make sure that it wasn't still viable. And it turns out it's not. Tuberculosis is only good on non-pore surfaces for about 48 hours, maybe a month in, in certain situations. So we are good there. But it does turn out that you can do the assay of it and find out someone's genetic code from the, um, the adhesive that's on there. Not that we'd want to do that, but that's what I found out. And after I, I got the clearance on that, I felt a little bit better. Um, most of the damage for this poor thing is it's, the, it's incredibly structurally embrittled. There's many different kinds of paper, uh, 22 pieces of paper to be exact. And you can tell in the raking light shot here on the left that um, this is actually aged in a different way from the other pieces of paper, which is very typical because um, depending on what something's made out of, it's going to age differently than um, something else. We also had huge losses, uh, rodent damage, um, and my favorite was the insect damage up in lung here. So wherever there was a really thick deposit of paste, we had a lot of insect um, activity. So here's an example. I'm just testing the, the colorants under the microscope before I start humidifying and flattening. Um, on the left is just a very basic humidifi uh, an overall humidification. Um, this piece, I, it, it's hard in a way to, uh, you probably think I'm crazy because I've been um, moving the um, slides back and forth, but so much of this process was do a little bit of this and then go back and do a little of this. Um, first it had to be humidified enough to mend a certain area, and then certain areas had to be, had to be mended so you could humidify more. It was a back and forth sort of effort. Um, so the, the last part of this treatment, um, there, were th there were three major kinds of losses. There were losses in the physical support and the overlying media. There were losses in the, um, the media itself where the, an the, where the insects had just grazed the color off. Um, and then, of course, there was the, the structural distortions that I showed you in the raking light shot. Um, I went back to crayons when I was getting ready to make the fills because it looked like crayon to begin with, and I didn't really want to start using inks. Um, I want to be really clear here. Um, when I'm talking about making a fill, I'm not talking about m putting the media on the object itself. I'm talking about putting media on the paper fills that are going to go into the holes. So no media went on to the object, um, only onto the fills. And Everything I did was in very close collaboration with Catherine Blood. Uh, the, this, this, um, this drawing ended up transferring over to uh, um, prints and photographs since they had the sort of the flat art collection of the Eames collection. So since it was no longer deemed part of the manuscript and archives collection, it left manuscripts and went to prints and photographs. And so then I began working with the prints and photographs curator. Now, the one thing that didn't work, and it, it's crazy, I mean, I bought the biggest box of crayon I could that had all these different shades of blue in it, and it didn't work. There was not one modern blue that matched the blues in this object. And everyone thought I was totally crazy, and I tried watercolor, I tried acrylic, I was dragging um, you know, my little pieces of map board everywhere. I was trying to get the right marks to make the fills in this thing. And so then I went back to good old eBay again, and I ordered, um, I purchased a couple boxes of old crayons, and guess what? The blues that match perfectly are one that's called dark blue and a couple that are um, praying colors. Perfect, perfect match. And here, I, this is just me um, fiddling which, what, what marks make the best blue. Over here, what you're seeing here is a loss in the media layer. There's no loss in the paper. Well, if it is, it's residual. Um, but in order to make a fill there, I couldn't just fill it with a, with a heavy piece of paper like I might if in a loss that was in, in a larger piece of the heavier paper. So what I was using is I was using a very thin Japanese tissue called gompi, and I was using my crayon marks on the gompi and then doing um, some needle splitting to make these very thin little um, fills. And what you're seeing here is a spatula and a little brush with put using, I'm using methyl cellulose um, to put down this fill. And then you can see here, um, I'm patting it into place. But this whole area was 
had lots of losses in it. And here's the before and after, just so you can get a sense. Um, the other important part of this treatment was that it was really important to Catherine that I not try to make up any imagery. I didn't, try, you know, we don't know if this was a deer or a rabbit, and I wasn't going to try drawing ears to figure it out. Um, so I tried to just make uh, a very nice toned area that blended with everything else and um, left the identity of the, of the animal to Martin. So, um, um, the next part of this uh, object, I probably would have just stopped here, but um, as what happens in museums and libraries, this, I had um, discussed with the curators that when this was going to be exhibited for the celebration of Mexico, it was going to be exhibited flat because it's very fragile and um, it just didn't seem to be a very good idea to put it more than about 10 or 15 degrees to the, to the normal. So if this is a normal, it'd be no more than this. Well, that was not what they wanted. They wanted it um, hung vertically. So we, um, used, we made hinges out of Japanese tissue and hinges were attached around the edge of the object. However, if you can picture again, so here's the raking light shot. Just because we flattened this object, the, the best what we really did is, it, when you have something that, that's this wrinkly and you have paper that's stretched in some areas and shrink, shrunk in other areas, you have to redistribute the forces or the stresses so that, and that becomes part of what we do as being sort of an artful thing, is that you have to try to put these creases where you, you have to put a crease somewhere because you have extra paper. You wanna put it someplace where it's gonna cause the least amount of damage and put the least amount of stress on, um, on very vulnerable areas. So that's what you're looking at here. This is before raking, this is a raking light shot of before um, the humidifying and flattening step. And here it is afterwards. And it's right before we started applying the hinges. So the hinges, it's, for example, if this is a very vulnerable area, then what I did, is, um, or myself would do it as a um, technician, we would put a hinge here and here. Then it would force this area up so that it was in a, it was in a much more stable up position. And you can see here from over here, something over here, if there's one inch of tissue stirred up, if it's too many strength on it, you would push it down and push things underneath it. And I don't know if that makes sense, so I made this schematic. Um, so in step one, here you go, you apply all your hinges all the way around, and your bigger hinges, thanks to who fib, up here at the top. Then if you can visualize if the verso is the back of your object, and we're gonna flip it over now, And so that's what you see here. Oops. See? Um, and here we are turning all the, the, all the hinges up under. That's what you're seeing here too. And then once this was uh, on its board, we then we attached it to the back mat. And the secondary and tertiary support was uh, the, the, the solution for trying to get this thing um, in vertical position. Um, this was a really wonderful experience. I, it, 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 it's, it's a good treatment for what we're discussing here today. Um, when someone said that, uh, you know, the original definition of outsider art is someone who is insane, I thought, me, 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 that's, I have that. Um, it's just what this, what this person worked through. He was, you know, he was doing his own therapy. He was working through his own issues. And it seems so obvious to me that he was trying so hard to be home and uh, take care of his, his, uh, his sadness. The stamps, buy the stamps, March 26th. Martin Romero stamps are coming out of the post office.